Um, so if, um, I guess I have my mandate now to, to start this panel going officially. Uh, this uh, Welcome uh, to our audience and to all present here to Race and Belonging in European History, a panel that was originally supposed to occur in Memphis in 2020, but then was rescheduled as a kind of displaced panel here uh, for the should have been New Orleans conference and now arriving virtually. So welcome everyone. Uh, I will be your chair and discussant. I am Andrew Barrett. I teach history at uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri. And I'm happy to have here Lawrence Hare and Sarah Panzer uh, forming a uh, kind of triumvirate uh, of the Ozark Mountains, um, both from Missouri and Northwest Arkansas. Um, before I introduce them individually, I, I have to regret to inform the audience that the third panelist, Emily Brinkman, will be unable to attend. Uh, she is experiencing health concerns and uh, is not able to join us. So I, um, it will just be the two papers here, which gives us plenty of time, of course, for extended Q&A um, and maybe feeling a little less under the gun as far as the time constraints go. So I propose the following for the organization of the panel. And uh, Lawrence and Sarah, please let me know uh, if you disagree. But I think it would be most productive to uh, proceed in kind of chronological order of the papers, Lawrence and then Sarah, um, uh, without any discussion in between. And then we will have a kind of common discussion in the remaining time, which I suppose will be uh, that much more generative of, you know, kind of cross currents and comparisons and um, everyone having in their minds uh, the way that the two papers gel together, which I think they gel uh, actually quite nicely. Um, so hearing no objections, let me then introduce uh, Dr. Lawrence Hare from the University of Arkansas. Uh, Lawrence is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Inter International and Global Studies Program at the University of Arkansas in addition to serving as chair of his department. So quite a list of <laughs> positions there. He holds a, a PhD in modern European history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and specializes in the intellectual and cultural history of Germany and Scandinavia. In addition to being the author of numerous journal articles and book chapters and many, many book reviews, as I've noticed, he is the author of Excavating Nations, Archaeology, Museums, and the German-Danish Borderlands, published by University of Toronto in 2015, and Essential Skills for Historians, A Practical Guide to Researching the Past, published by Bloomsbury in 2020. He is currently at work on his next monograph, The Discovery of the North, Scandinavia and the Making of Modern Germany, and has an article forthcoming in the Yearbook of Transnational History titled On the Novelty of Transnational History. He is presenting here today the paper Germans, Danes, and the invention of Nordicism in the 19th century. So take it away, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. If it makes anyone feel better, I did step down as director of international global studies. So I'm, I'm just chair, just, just one, one administrative job at this point, and then a little bit of time to work on the book. And so I'm going to talk about the, the current project, which is the a study of the German fascination with the Nordic regions. <clears throat> Let me start at the sort of the end of the 19th century and sort of work backwards if that, if that works. Um, so at the time of his death in 1884, um, the philologist Karl Muhlenhoff was at the top of his game. He had been professor ordinarius in Germanistik at the University of Berlin since 1858, having ascended to the chair formerly occupied by the eminent Germanist Friedrich von der Haugen. More importantly, he had reached the final pages of a magisterial five-volume study of German language and heritage, Deutsche Altertumskunde, which refers to the study of German antiquities. This expansive work, nearly 20 years in the making and not quite complete at the time of his death, was breathtaking in scope. It wound its way through the early textual history of the German-speaking lands, encompassing the earliest Greek and Roman documentary evidence and incorporating close readings of a bevy of myths, folklore, histories, and sagas. The ambition evident in Muhlenhoff's approach reflected his overarching goal, which was to identify within his sources the spiritual roots of the nation. As he explained in the first volume, philo uh, quote, philology is the only studium humanitas that pursues the education of the spirit and character in both individuals and nations from the viewpoint of the unity and totality of mankind. 
Uh, in this way, his magnum opus was intended as a fusion of the universal and the particular, the spiritual and the material, and above all, the German, the Germanic, and the Nordic. It is this search for integration that interests me here, and especially the significance that it placed upon a particular vision of Northern Europe. In his investigation of the roots of the German nation, Mühlenhoff by no means confined his study to the contemporary political boundaries of the German Empire. Deutsche Altertumskunde reached deep into the Scandinavian lands with entire chapters devoted to the surveys of the legends of Icy Tula or analyses of old Norse sagas. The entire fifth and final volume was dedicated to the Icelandic Eddas, which Mühlenhoff interpreted as late examples of early traditions un unadulterated by classical or Christian influence. In my current project, I'm investigating these sorts of approaches in which Germans, Scandinavians, and others were both drawn by and actively cultivated the ideal uh, of a sort of inherent or even transcendental uniqueness to the region. Beyond their fascination was a belief and an underlying ethos that manifested itself in the Nordic lands in a variety of artistic, cultural, ethnic, or spiritual forms, and that ultimately promised to illuminate the nature of self and nation in neighboring countries. In order to understand both the impulse to apply scholarship, travel, and other forms of transnational engagement to defining and appropriating this perceived ethos, I employ the term, the term Nordicism. Um, Mühlenhoff is an especially interesting participant in this movement, in part because he hailed from a region uh, deeply imbued with the ambiguities of German-Scandinavian ties. Despite his lofty scholarly rank, he had actually begun his career quite modestly as a school teacher in the Plattdeutsch environs of Meldorf, a small town in the former Duchy of Holstein. He had come of age in an era of border conflict between Germans and Danes, and he honed his scholarly talents uh, amidst the acute uncertainties of nationhood in this region, where patriots on both sides sought to balance their hopes for clear borders with an impulse to reach out and see themselves within the mix of overlapping dialects, languages, cultures, and heritages. Indeed, Mühlenhoff forged his early career in dialogue with Danish colleagues, and the origins of his final masterpiece uh, lay with a visit from the Danish king Christian IX to Meldorf, uh, or the region around Meldorf, in 1842. According to Mühlenhoff's biographer, the Germanist Wilhelm Scherer, the young scholar took advantage of the royal visit to request a travel grant to Copenhagen and Stockholm, arguing that his studies of German folklore and antiquities were incomplete without consideration of Nordic language and literature. As the let me stop for a second and just say that as the historiography of modern Germany increasingly turns outward, respatializing the field with a more post-colonial global lens, it is worth weighing even these seemingly minor episodes. In this case, Mühlenhoff's application for a grant was a routine activity for any scholar, but it nonetheless signaled the emergence of a transnational perspective rooted in a national ideal. It reminds us of the complexity and richness of transnationalism as a focus of historical study. I, and this sort of touches on the, the article that I wrote for the, that I have coming out in the journal. I, I'm not trying to undermine the views of, of historians like Sebastian Conrad or, or Michael Geyer or, or Jürgen Osterhammel who, who have integrated German history into a wider narrative by blending transnationalism and, and globalization or who have characterized waves of nationalist retrenchment as a confrontation with global forces. Rather, I'm interested in the ways that a transnational vision can operate differently as a mechanism of nation building through a national imaginary that draws um, from beyond national borders. In other words, my current work is concerned with understanding how nations are imagined as an outside in process. <clears throat> Ultimately, this is the process that Karl Mühlenhoff uh, wished to use. His research into national origins, and by extension, his efficacy as an agent of the nation, rested on the presumption that they could be found not only in the mists of time, but also along a distant horizon. In his case, the answers lay to the north, and their discovery depended on cultivating a body of knowledge about the landscapes, cultures, and peoples of the region. Mühlenhoff's Deutsche Altertumskunde was thus important within the broader intellectual project of Nordicism. It contributed to a body of knowledge informed by a particular orientation towards the North, by an idealized utopian impulse, 
and by a set of assumptions about its relationship to one's own homeland. I would argue that Nordicism was not limited to Germany, but that Germans were critical to its intellectual development. Russians, Britons, Canadians, and Americans each expressed or have expressed their own fascination with the region, uh, and each was drawn by mixed curiosity about geography and culture. The quality of interest, along with the content of its expression, has changed markedly over time, and in various iterations has come to include a focus on nature, aesthetics, lifestyle, myth, heritage, and of course, race and ethnicity. Certainly, the latter has right, quite rightly occupied much scholarly attention, but I maintain that there is a great deal to learn by adopting a wider view, analyzing the various and overlapping expressions of Nordicism within the context of an underlying fascination that led Europeans to develop their assumptions about the peoples and lands of Scandinavia. And this is why Germany, and especially in this case, the Schleswig-Holstein region where Karl Muenhoff began his work, is so central to our understanding. As a framework for understanding a particular, though in this case very diffuse, intellectual project, um, it's worth pointing out that the contours and historical trajectory of German Nordicism bear a close relationship to the parallel trends of classicism and Orientalism. All three share a number of common attributes. For instance, each emerged as a discourse derived from a purported body of knowledge about specific regions, historical eras, or groups, the knowledge often conveyed on the one hand a sense of difference between the object of discourse and its creators, but on the other hand, it invariably expressed deep, often visceral ties. In Germany, these three trends crafted links to the roots of the nation's Christian faith or civic culture, and more fundamentally to a self-understanding as a coherent group, speaking above all to an ideal of uh, folk. In this way, the effect of each was to evoke a romantic sensibility through an appeal to the spiritual, connecting the participant to a transcendent element of human existence, yet the content of the discourse and the object of the knowledge was invariably material or empirical. For this reason, each trend formed within a state of tension between the inspiration of emotional experience and the promise of empirical certainty. Finally, the agents of discourse, those who created and disseminated belonged to similar groups, travelers and writers, for, for instance, who could credibly convey content, emissaries or who participated in the discourse or personified the discourse, and, and scholars who could interpret its meaning. The effect of these three trends may have seemed perennial, but their origins were decidedly historical. And indeed, the three emerged roughly at the same time, at the same period in the, in the 18th century. Okay, I told you the title was about the 19th century, but now I want to talk about the 18th century because that's because we got extra time. What can we, you know? Uh, certainly, as Said indicated, um, academic study of the Orient was underway not long after Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in the late 1790s. Classical Philhellenism was perhaps a bit older, emerging in the mid 18th century as part of what Peter Watson has called the Third Renaissance. And, and so it was with Nordicism, whose appearance, I propose, gradually became possible through the waning of Swedish and Danish power over the course of the 18th century. If pressed to identify a moment of crystallization, we might point to three foundational texts for each trend that appeared over a roughly 50-year span in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The first of these, uh, Die Geschichte der Kunst des Altertums, a history of the art of antiquity from Johann Joachim Winkelmann in 1764, helped launch a, a, a um, Philhellenic wave that began in the realm of aesthetics, but quickly crept into politics and education. The second, Friedrich Schlegel's 1808 work, Über die Sprache und Weisheit der Indier, on the language and wisdom of the Indians, uh, launched a unique German engagement with Orientalist thought and inspired a deep investigation of language as a pathway to the understanding the origins of the German people. Within the overlooked strains of Nordicism, the touchstone text, I would argue, was August Ludwig von Schlitzer's work, Allgemeine Nordische Geschichte, which is a comprehensive history of the North from 1771 and covered a vast region stretching from Iceland to Siberia. If its intellectual legacy has been overlooked, well, this is partly because 
uh, Friedrich Meinecke, I just thought of this. He he wrote a he he basically wrote Schlitzer out of the narrative of historiography because he didn't feel like he conformed to the uh, to the spirit of historicism. So that's one reason why he got overlooked. We we can talk about that. The the other is um, is because Schlitzer sur, uh, surmounted a deficit of historical texts in his work by relying upon classical sur, uh, sources and by leading credence to um, semi mythical elements. But, but it is worth considering what Schlitzer achieved. Um, first, his study provided a sense of historical depth that placed the North on a level analogous to the ancient Greco-Roman and Vedic cultures. Second, at a time when the geographical consciousness of Europeans was shifting rather dramatically uh, from a North-South to an East-West axis, and we can refer here to Larry Wolf's work on the subject, Schlitzer's work was key to redefining the North which created opportunities for investing the region with a fresh round of utopian imaginings. More specifically, Schlitzer helped define the spatial relationship between Germany and Scandinavia. His geography segregated Germany and the Nordic lands, creating a sense of distinction between the two. But by setting the purported boundaries at the Elba and Danube rivers, his vision left them practically intertwined with portions of Prussia, Pomerania, and of course, Schleswig and Holstein, preserving a sense of organic connection. Appearing over a century later, Karl Mühlenhoff's Deutsche Altertumskunde also belongs to our perspective canon of seminal Nordicist texts, but in a different way befitting a second or third intellectual generation. Where Schlitzer created mental space for unraveling older notions of the relationship between Germany and Scandinavia, Mühlenhoff's five volumes sought to achieve a reintegration of the two. At the same time, Mühlenhoff, by implying a direct link between the German national heritage and indeed the German folkish spirit and the mythical and literary traditions of the Nordic lands, attempted in a similar way to integrate the romantic and empirical elements and thereby resolve the inherent tensions embedded within Nordicist thought. No discussion of these three trends is complete, of course, without consideration of the power dynamics at work. Edward Said, of course, saw power as the principal fruit of Orientalist knowledge, and his decision to underplay the German variety in his classic work on the subject rested on the argument that the Germans had a very small colonial footprint in the Near East and the Orient. Now, of course, historians have since taken issue with this oversight, with Sarah Roshamadi and Suzanne Marchand and others um, stressing the role of Orientalist engagement in cultural politics and the forging of an imperialist imagination. Germanists know that's a, t that's a great buzzword for Germanists. Period. Yeah, we can talk about that too. From this perspective, the same seems true of Philhellenic classicism, where a deep-seated fascination and sense of psychic connection engendered an empirical undertaking that informed power relationships, real and imagined, between Germans and the Mediterranean countries, also the Near East and the Pacific Rim. In each case, the power imbalance seems to have been enhanced by the one-sided nature of knowledge production. As in the case of other national orientalist traditions, scholars and other agents of Asian and North African descent were strikingly absent, while classicist discourse emerged through dialogue only with text and artifacts left behind by ancient Greeks and Romans long dead. There were apparently none from within the cultures and lands under study who could act to shape or check a process of discovery and interpretation that yielded a power dynamic of manipulation, selective appropriation, and moral judgment. Yet it is here that the study of the parallel trend of Nordicism, and especially its articulation in the German-Danish border region, offers opportunity for fresh insight. This is because Nordicist thought expressed an interest in both the heritage of the Nordic lands and in the contemporary cultures, environments, and peoples of the region. These were topics that Danes, Swedes, and other Nordic peoples were no less interested in investigating and that they wished uh, to use to inform their own national nationalist interpret I'm sorry, nationalist aspirations. Consequently, Nordicism, in a way that has been overlooked, perhaps in studies of Orientalism and Philhellenism, provides an opportunity to assess the agency of the appropriated and to understand how power dynamics are shaped or were shaped by dialogue. I mean, certainly dialogue is what Mühlenhoff wanted when he applied for a grant from the Danish monarchy in 1842. In so doing, he saw himself entering a scholarly milieu steeped in a tradition of cooperation among German and Danish speaking academics, 
which is very much the norm in the first decades of the 19th century. In his appeal, Muhlenhoff described his objectives in these very terms, writing that he was motivated to study the Norse sagas, quote, that once bound together in unity, all the Germanic peoples in South, North, and West. He wished, in short, to capture a Nordic ethos with ancient texts that carried a germ of his own uh, Germanic heritage. There is perhaps one more lesson to close here contained within this rather modest episode. As it turns out, Millenhoff was turned down for his grant. He didn't get it. We all know what that's like. Uh, in a letter from April 1843, the royal government handed down a negative decision, arguing that his application had not observed normal channels. Uh, I guess you just don't go up to the king when he comes to visit and ask for a grant. That's the lesson. Of course, one may question, as Muhlenhoff did, whether any channels were suitably open to a scholar from provincial Holstein pursuing a project related to German identity in the midst of an embattled border question. In any case, Muhlenhoff continued his work, but he did so without traveling, eventually working from a new position at the University of Kiel. And the University of Kiel was a pretty pro-German pl place to be in that period. A few years later, the revolutions of 1848 brought about the first German-Danish war over the fate of the borderlands, and decades of academic cooperation came to a halt. Ten years later, Muhlenhoff departed Kiel for Berlin and began his five-volume masterwork. Now, in this, we're reminded that transnational currents and cross-border exchange are often as much about failure as about success. They are not simply moments of connection, but also accounts of separation and alienation. And these may do little to staunch a yearning for questions that lay beyond borders, but which force a more virtual engagement. And I wrote that before we did this meeting online, by the way, I, you know, that's just a coincidence. Okay, so the impact of Nordis's thought was profound because it meant that one of the signature texts of the trend was drafted once again in the absence of dialogue. It suggests a historical process by which we can understand how constellations of power develop over time and how a shared dialogue can give way to a one-sided appropriation and come to shape in international relationships, conflicts, and even occupation in the years to come, which is which will take us into the 20th century. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Lawrence. Sorry, I had to uh, reposition my microphone. I've got this <laughs> elaborate boom system here. All right, thank you very much. Um, so as I said, we're going to uh, move now to the second paper and then um, following some commentary on my part, uh, we'll take the questions and answers at that point. So allow me then now to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Panzer of the Missouri State University. Uh, Dr. Panzer is a historian of modern Europe with a particular interest in the transnational and global dimensions of modern German history. Her research to date has focused on the reception and appropriation of Japanese martial culture by Germans during the first half of the 20th century as an attempt to conceptualize an alternative culturally bounded form of modernity, which is reflected in her recent article in the Bulletin of the German Historical Institute, Prussians of the East, Samurai, Bushido, and Japanese Honor in the German Imagination, 1905 to 1945. Currently, she is writing her first book, tentatively titled Heroes Like Us, Japan and the German Struggle with Modernity. Her second project will be a sustained analysis of the reproduction of German identity within the unique social spaces of the POW camps constructed and maintained in Japan during the First World War. All right. All right. Uh, take it away, Sarah. Okay. Well, uh, great. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm, uh, like Lauren said, I'm going to take it us up into the 20th century with a bit of a detour into the 19th as well. And um, I'm excited to think about some of the intersections between our two papers. So um, my paper for today is uh, working on um, a subject that um, I'm hoping to develop into an article relatively soon, looking at a minority population of German Japanese uh, mixed race individuals in the Nazi state. So um, I'm going to go ahead and Bear with me while I read, and then I look forward to getting your questions. Uh, so on April 20th, 1934, the Deutsche Panzergesellschaft, which I'm just going to abbreviate uh, 
henceforth as the DJG, uh, received a letter from the Countess Hannah Hatzfeld Aoki on what may have initially appeared a trivial matter. The Countess and her daughter Hisa, who had also married into the Silesian landowning nobility, had encountered difficulties in their attempts to join the kinds of charitable organizations typically patronized by women of their class, owing to Hannah's racial background. Uh, so Hana was the daughter of uh, Aoki Shuzo, who is the uh, former Japanese foreign minister and ambassador to the United States, as well as Great Britain, and his German wife. And so she was, at least as far as the, uh, the Nazi so-called racial state was concerned, a non-erring Michelin, and thus an ineligible for membership in these kinds of organizations. Hatzfeld Aoki, however, had heard rumors in an official regulation requiring that all Japanese and their offspring be treated as, uh, quote unquote, honorary Aryans, which would have ex effectively exempted them from any discrimin discriminatory laws or politics. Confident in the logic of this legal loophole, Hatzfeld Aoki requested that the DJG send her and her daughter proof of this policy in order to resolve the matter with their local officials as quickly as possible. And what, if, what must have come as a disappointment, the DJG informed her that it was unaware of any official decision regarding the status of Japanese Germans under the um, Aryan paragraph and promised to refer her case to the foreign ministry for clarification. Even with the assistance of the DJG, it is unclear whether the status of the Hatzfeld Aoki family was ever fully resolved. Part of the problem, at least initially, was a lack of clarity over which office or individual was responsible for adjudicating such cases. The creation of the Office of Racial Policy may have resolved the problem to a degree, but the much more substantive underlying issue remained the fundamental lack of consensus within the Nazi state regarding the racial status of the Japanese, which then, of course, um, factored into this question of what to do with these mixed-race individuals. This lack of consensus, which emerged out of fundamentally opposed ideologies of race, was reflected in the persistent rumors, both in Germany and abroad, that the Japanese had, in fact, been recognized and accorded special privileges as honorary Aryans. Although this special designation was indeed only a rumor, uh, it was the un unique position of the Japanese within the Nazi Weltanschauung that made such rumors plausible. Uh, in short, it was the internal contradictions of the Nazi racial state that allowed the Japanese to effectively uh, become Aryan in the minds of the German public at the same time that state policy continued to discriminate against the actual minority population of Japanese Germans. As a significant body of historical research has shown, and I'm thinking here of um, scholarship by people like Louisa White, um, uh, rumors tend to proliferate around events or phenomena defined by uncertainty. Hannah Hatzfeld Aoki was not alone in perceiving the rumor of the honorary Aryan status of the Japanese as credible. The international press also apparently fell for the rumor. In an article from May 34, so just one month after her letter, uh, the New York Times reported that, quote, finally, Nazi Germany has broken in favor of Japan her proudest principle, namely that of, of racial exclusiveness. The Japanese government, as well as the Chinese, have been, has been a, a notified officially that German laws against non-Aryans apply only to Jews and Negroes, not to the yellow race, end quote. Just as the lack of clarity surrounding Nazi racial policy towards the Japanese enabled the myth of honorary Aryan status to circulate widely during the 1930s in Germany and, and uh, internationally, so too has the dearth of scholarly analysis on race within the German-Japanese alliance enabled the persistence of this myth, albeit primarily online. So I just recently did a Google search for this term honorary Aryan and uh, the current uh, yield is somewhere over uh, 214,000 hits through Google, um, beginning with a Wikipedia page dedicated to the term and followed by a lot of uh, forum debate over uh, its supposed parameters and historical validity. Um, and all of this, uh, despite the fact that there is no actual policy. Uh, while this debate has generally been framed around either confirming or debunking the concept of honorary Aryan, often but by no means exclusively connected with the Japanese. You'll also see these rumors connected to uh, the Hungarians and the Finns. 
Um, I will instead concentrate for the remainder of my paper today on examining why exactly this frame of honorary Aryan remains so powerful way of understanding the German-Japanese alliance. Uh, so the Japanese had been the object of scrutiny by German naturalists, anthropologists, and racial scientists since the 19th century. Uh, the naturalist Philip von, uh, von Siebold, in his comprehensive survey of the flora and fauna of the Japanese archipelago, was the first to comment on the racial composition of the Japanese people. Significantly, Siebold claimed to have observed individuals with complexions that did not conform to what he typically took to be the so-called Mongolian race, which led him to speculate that the Japanese were not actually related racially to the Chinese or Koreans, uh, despite the obvious cultural inheritance from the mainland, but instead were descendants of Tartar migrants. Uh, some 50 years later, the physician uh, Evan Beltz com compiled his own thoughts on the racial qualities of the Japanese people, and he concluded that the contemporary Japanese were the product of multiple successive migrations from other parts of Asia, um, as well as um, Eastern Europe, and the variability of features, complexion, and bodily proportions among the Japanese were the result of racial mixing over the subsequent centuries. Although most of Beltz's racial work more or less mirrored similar studies being done by Europeans globally at this time, he did make two claims that are worth highlighting. He echoed Siebold's claim that he had seen individuals of undoubtedly Japanese descent with blonde hair and even with blue eyes. And he suggested a racial link between the indigenous Ainu people of Northern Japan and, and, um, and Europeans. Uh, these studies by Siebold and Beltz, as speculative as they were, provided the basis for much of the later discussions and debates surrounding the Japanese, uh, both within Japan itself as well as within um, the Nazi state. Beso uh, beyond their respective contributions to nascent German impressions of the Japanese, one other significant commonality that Siebold and uh, Beltz shared was their personal and familial connection to the Japanese people. Both men, while in Japan, married uh, Japanese women and subsequently fathered biracial children. Although her father was banished from Japan in 1829 on suspicion of spying for Russia, Zebold's daughter, uh, Kusumoto um, Ine, became the first Japanese woman to receive Western medical training, and she later became a court physician for the Meiji Emperor. Evan Beltz, on the other hand, was able to bring his family with him when he returned to Germany in 1905, and his son Evan Toku Beltz uh, became a key figure in promoting Japanese arts and culture, uh, including kabuki, on behalf of the DJG in the 1930s. Of course, these kinds of racially complicated families were not uh, unusual within the uh, rapidly globalizing world of the 19th century, although they are most commonly associated with more explicitly colonial contexts. What made, these emer what made the emerging uh, Japanese-German community distinct, however, was how many of these individuals, like Evan Tokubeyats or Hana Hatsuraoki, um, who lived in Germany and believed themselves to be fully unproblematically German. In other words, they did not necessarily see themselves as Japanese or as mixed, they saw themselves as German. The potential of racial ideology to explode the status quo emerged relatively quickly following Hitler's appointment as, as chancellor. And the initial slate of racial legislation passed in April 33, um, uh, raise some questions within the Japanese public and the Japanese media, as you see reflected in a conversation between Fuji Kenosuke, a legal counsel for the Japanese embassy in Berlin, and Friedrich Wilhelm Hack, uh, the DJG's German director. Fuji cited uh, several cases of discrimination against Japanese nationals in Germany that had received extensive coverage in the Japanese press, including a physical assault on a nine-year-old girl um, who was the daughter of a Japanese businessman. Uh, these reports, when coupled with uh, recent statements by high-ranking officials on the struggle uh, between the so-called white and colored races, gave credence to Fuji's concern uh, that Japanese public opinion towards the Nazi regime could rapidly sour. All available evidence seemed to suggest that the Nazi leadership saw them as yet another uh, quote unquote colored people and insulted Japanese or to Japan's own 
racially motivated pride that could irreparably damage both official and non-official relations. Because the Japanese, um, because the, the racial status of the Japanese remained officially unresolved, the DJ, uh, DJG saw this as an opportunity to lobby their case directly to the bureaucracy of the Nazi state. Uh, consequently, a memorandum attempting to clarify the racial and legal status of the Japanese Germans signed on behalf of the DJG by the organization's president, Paul Benke, uh, was submitted to uh, Wilhelm uh, Frick in the Interior Ministry, Konstantin von Neurath in the Foreign Ministry, and Rudolf Hess, um, the, the deputy of the Führer, on October 25th, 1935. And then it was uh, subsequently forwarded to the Office of Racial Policy a few days later. The attached cover letter, also signed by Venke, uh, explained that the document was intended to ensure the Japanese Germans did not unduly suffer discrimination, either at the hands of officials or of German citizens confused or unclear about their, their racial status. The memorandum was therefore effectively an attempt to mobilize existing racial discourse on behalf of the Japanese Germans, which could very well, if it had been successful, have resulted in something similar to the um, purported uh, or mythic uh, honorary Aryan status. Although signed by Benke, the memorandum was actually written by Johann von Leas, uh, an employee of the Ministry of Propaganda, who was also uh, later appointed to a university position at, um, at Jena. Uh, Lair shared the anti-Semitism of his colleagues. Um, he was quite uh, viciously anti-Semitic, but he was comparatively open-minded with respect to non-European cultures and religious traditions. In fact, um, um, post-45, he actually con uh, converted to Islam and ended up in uh, Egypt working for Nasser. Um, as someone conversant in the rhetorical and ideological conventions of the Nazi state, yet also deeply sympathetic to the Japanese, Leos was an ideal candidate to advocate on behalf of the Japanese Germans. Uh, he began the memorandum uh, by speaking directly to the difficulties faced by the Japanese Germans as a result of the uh, Nazi state's unwillingness to take a firm position one way or another. In his mind, the resulting confusion had been particularly unfortunate because Quote, there is every opportunity here not only to achieve sympathy for the German cause, but also to find certain common philosophical principles, i.e. the fight against communism. The only obstacle between Japan and us is this unfortunate racial question, which if not solved or solved unsatisfactorily, threatens to destroy these good relations. The fundamental problem Lehr su suggested was that the German state simply did not understand why the Japanese were so offended by the use of terms like colored or yellow, and that the German government should therefore make an attempt to better explain its racial principles to the Japanese, principles that Lehr's himself did not find in any way antithetical to a future Japanese-German alliance. Over the course of, of this memorandum, and this is, this is a fairly lengthy document, uh, Lair sought to negotiate an alternative, more clearly defined system of racial categorization sympathetic to the Japanese. Um, in one particularly uh, interesting passage, he attempted to tackle one of the central problems of Nazi racial ideology, um, and that is this question of Aryan as, an, as a linguistic term versus Aryan as a racial grouping. Uh, deploying both biological and linguistic theories of race, Lairs ultimately concluded that if Aryan could be expanded to include the Hungarians, Turks, and Finns, and there had been arguments along those lines already, then logically the Japanese should also be considered as part of this sort of expanded Aryan category. Arguing the terms of like white, yellow, and colored could no longer be considered scientific racial terms. Lairs instead offered several studies by earlier German scientists, including those by Sabold and Bailtz mentioned above, as proof that the uh, Japanese could be considered Aryan. An additional scholar uh, cited extensively by Lairs um, in, in support of this claim for the Japanese as being Aryan was the influential uh, racial anthropologist and Nordicist uh, Hans Guth, uh, Gunther, uh, one of the most more popular uh, figures um, in, in sort of popularizing racial theory in the Third Reich. And uh, Gunther had argued that traces of Nordic racial ancestry could be identified 
um, among uh, Japan's military and political elites. Quote, when one looks at photos of Japanese statesmen, generals, and admirables, um, admirals, there is a conspicuously large majority of those depicted, comparatively speaking, that have an un-Japanese appearance, which always suggests instead an approximation of European features. Out of the photos of Japanese with doctorates listed in the Seki's Who's Who in Great Japan, the comparatively common narrow face and nose, the high nasal bridge, the common beardedness, and the general lack of the Mongol fold of the eyes is striking. Uh, so Lair cited uh, this passage and others from Gunta in corroborating his own physical or his own racial theories. Um, he was himself, however, primarily interested in an altogether different interpretation of race, one that was based and said on the expression of cultural and symbolic markers rather than on physical features. So his understanding of race was much more embedded in culture rather than in um, biology. Uh, he purported to have discovered traces of Nordic culture in Japanese heraldry and funerary rites, ultimately concluding that not only should the Japanese be understood as a Nordic people, but that they represented one of the few remnants of true authentic Nordic culture. Uh, quote, we therefore have in the Japanese a folk to observe, which in its roots and origins, despite multiple subsequent mixings, harkens back to the same racial strength as us. Yet while all the state formations of the Nordic race from the pre-Indo-Germanic or Neolithic period collapsed, in the seclusion of the islands, this was preserved and bears even today perceptibly the traces of the old Nordic immigration, end quote. So in presenting the Japanese as racially identifiable, not just as Aryan, but indeed as Nordic, Lairs intended to have them officially recognized by the Nazi state as a kindred folk. Uh, in hindsight, however, his elaborate theories speak to the fact that racial discourse within Nazi Germany was quite often as much a matter of myth as it was of science. The Lairs official, or I'm sorry, uh, the state's official response to Lairs and the DJG was composed by the head of the ORP, Dr. Walter Gross, and was received by the DJG in January 1935. In his response, Gross rejected many of the claims advanced by Lairs, most significantly that the Japanese could be considered Aryan on the basis of, of a possible shared genetic ancestry. Gross rebuted um, this claim by uh, not addressing its verifiability, which of course was impossible, uh, but instead its political implications. Speculation or I'm speculating that even the, quote, lowliest African tribes could then also claim Aryan status on the basis of some unknown mythical progenitor. Furthermore, the repercussions of any official acknowledgement of the Japanese as a Nordic people would only dilute the potency of Nazi racial thought, according to Gross, because then um, any people could claim parity with the Germans on the basis of, quote, their great history and culture. Although this was certainly not his intention, in his statement, Gross implicitly acknowledged the fact that he and Leas were ultimately arguing for two very different ways of understanding and mobilizing the idea of race. He never disputed Leas' facts, fantastic as they may have been, but rather was more immediately concerned about the potential impact of um, these theories on the, inter or on the internal coherency of Nazi state policy. Yet even as he rejected the logic upon which um, the memorandum was based, Gross signaled a willingness to moderate state policy under certain conditions, referring to the need to maintain a balance between ideological purity and political expediency. He remained opposed in principle to any kind of intermarriage between races, but suggested that the relatively small number of Japanese Germans currently living in Germany could potentially enable uh, some certain exceptions for them in respect to political and legal rights, uh, similar in effect to the status of Jewish war veterans, at least early um, in the 1930s. This solution would have um, undoubtedly done little to assuage the concerns of either the uh, Japanese Germans or of Japanese public opinion. Uh, so in effect, this, this gambit by the DJG to sort of um, insert itself into the, uh, the state's uh, racial policy failed. But 
Um, for the duration of the Nazi era, the DJG uh, limited itself mostly to forwarding petitions from the Japanese German community attempting to verify their identity as members of um, the Nazi or the German Volksgemeinschaft to the relevant administrative or party office. So basically from this point on, they're trying to find loopholes, trying to find exceptions to these policies. Certainly Gross was much more interested in handling the issue informally and on a case-by-case -case basis. Even after the signing of the Anti-Comintern Pact in 1936, which represented the first formal diplomatic agreement between Germany and Japan, the D DJG continued to receive letters from Japanese Germans upset about their treatment by the various tentacles of the Nazi state's bureaucracy. Uh, so one of these uh, individuals, Hans Eckert von Koslowski, uh, his letter from 1939 is a particularly apt example of the uncertainty under which many Japanese Germans continue to live, as well as the fact that most responsible departments simply refuse to make a binding decision regarding their racial status. Uh, so Kozlowski's indignation at being forced to live as a, quote, third-class citizen within Germany, as well as, as well as his protestation that, quote, as a first-degree Japanese Michelin, he possessed more honor and better qualities than even many pure Aryans. Um, it's a profound statement as to the continuing racial tensions between Germany and Japan, as it, at least as it was experienced day to day by the small community of individuals for whom these questions had very real and profound implications, ranging from rejected applications for marriage licenses and a loss of, prudent, uh, a loss of prevent, uh, professional credentials um, to unemployment. And yet these individuals continue to protest their treatment, not as supplicants begging for mercy, but rather as citizens confident in their rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. So um, in all of these various petitions that I'm looking at, these individuals are introducing themselves to the bureaucracy as Germans, um, as, 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 mem as former members, um, in many cases of the Nazi party or various organizations. Um, there are several uh, former members of uh, various Freikorps organizations who are sort of uh, proclaiming their loyalty to the Nazi state and to Nazi ideals. And so there's, again, this, this real sense that at least for these individuals, their identity as mixed race is not in any way incompatible with their identity as um, loyal Nazis. Um, despite all evidence to the contrary, Many, many of these individuals remain convinced that there had been a mistake made in their specific case and that due remedy could be obtained if they simply alerted the proper authorities to the injustice. In a word, they subscribe to the rumors surrounding the fictive legal category of honorary Aryans and attempted to mobilize it as a form of self-constructed racial identity, even if the Nazi state itself did not concur. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, all right. So we've got about 40 minutes from now until the official end of the panel. So um, I'm not quite sure how long my commentary is going to last. Hopefully not, not too long because I would like to uh, privilege uh, questions from the audience, which I will moderate, um, as is my job, uh, and then funnel to the panelists in time. So let me just begin with a, um, a few common observations, uh, then I'll move into uh, a, a kind of individualized discussion of each paper with some individual questions and then uh, into a set of common questions that I think uh, both bind the papers together um, but highlight some of their distinctive qualities. So first of all, I what, what struck me about <clears throat> this this panel uh, and this, this pair of papers, particularly in the context which we find ourselves uh, in 2021, uh, but particularly at a meeting of the Southern Historical Association, which I'll be honest, until I was invited to serve on this uh, panel, I was not aware that there was a European uh, section of the Southern Historical Association, which I think is great. Um, but it does, it, it does, I think, provide this chance to to think about um, about context and and the meaning of context of um, you know the, the historical discipline. Um, in different times and places. And so I think I think this panel is especially helpful um, for asking questions, for investigating the historical messiness of the thing that we call race um, and, and looking at the many uh, tributary streams 
of the sometimes intellectually incoherent and indeed intellectually incompatible tendencies of uh, ways in which this idea is has been formulated across the centuries. Um, particularly, and I think this is sometimes, uh, at least in popular discourse, but uh, I think uh, especially the important role of science and, and, and sort of scientific language, uh, the heritage of particular disciplines anthropology, archaeology, linguistics, in the formation of race as an intellectual field, uh, and the role that that uh, intellectual inquiry becomes embedded, becomes institutionalized, becomes a part of official policy down the line. I think this policy, uh, this paper, or this set of papers really um, is very good in its sort of the compatibility of the two papers together um, in neatly kind of bridging that, especially in Sarah, in your paper, when you, you, you men mentioned the uh, the reference to Nordic uh, burial practices and rites as a way of justifying the belonging of, of Japanese in the Aryan context. Um, I think it's also um, a really nice pair of papers here for reminding us and really illustrating the perpetual unruliness of theory versus practice, right? One of the gr great historical drivers, <laughs> uh, certainly of intellectual history. Um, in, in this case, the uh, particularly the attempt to force reality into official frameworks and the ways of, you know, the disjuncture between categories that are fatal uh, and, 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 you know, have their power because they're taken to be uh, unassailable truth, but then here you encounter these uh, potential exceptions, uh, petitioners for exceptions, and, and what to do when that comes up and how to square circles or uh, how to ignore the problem altogether. Um, and I think uh, together, uh, in, in even broader, I think these papers do a really nice work in highlighting the transnationality and indeed the globality of race as a conscious uh, a concept, a conscious articulation, um, to say nothing of the, the less intellectualized constructions and understandings of race that develop in, you know, in, in contexts that are, are less uh, formally embedded in disciplines uh, like we've seen here or um, articulated by people in, 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 in lower positions of power. Um, I think the, the, the transnational character here is really highlighted by, again, the, just the kind of wonderful coincidence, at least in terms of this panel, uh, where the two papers overlap. Uh, finally, then, it just as kind of general thoughts here, uh, and trying to put this into an even larger context in which I think this entire um, uh, conference exists, is that, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a useful panel for really thinking about how race is uh, not a static concept. And it's not especially static, neither across time nor place. Um, and so that I think any... And we've seen here projects of, of trying to form it and form its ideas, and, and in the case of Sarah's paper, to enforce it as a, uh, a political concept. But I think also projects that uh, attempt to disarm it as a tool of oppression face a similar challenge to those who would use it for that purpose or use it as a way of, of definitively categorizing people, which is that it, it, it has this kind of character of, of, as, as a semiotic weed uh, that, that doesn't need any single environment in which to thrive, that it, that it has these different mutations uh, as you move from place to place. And, and even as the strains kind of are shared across continents, um, that it has a very shifty character and makes it a really difficult opponent, I think. Um, okay, so let me move now um, in, into individual comments. Um, Lawrence, thinking about your paper, two, um, two big points stuck out to me as being, uh, in my mind, especially uh, productive. And one was your point about the uh, nature of national identity and racial identity, um, I guess, by extension, as an outside-in process of development. And thinking about uh, 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 those interested in defining a German national character, looking to more or less distant horizons, um, and, and, and it seems to me uh, trying to Imagine the inner character based on the the affinities across that that horizon. Um, I, so I think this is a really interesting way of thinking about it, and I think it's an important point, um, especially I suppose because there's a certain inherent tendency to imagine nationalism and national identity as 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 uh, really only focusing on the in group, right? I still personally would like a little bit, maybe a little bit more clarity about how you envision this outside in kind of dynamic. 
Um, I, I think it's intuitively stated in the paper, but maybe some more mechanical specificity would be welcome. Um, uh, the second point is uh, in in your argument here that the uh, the Orientalist, as it were, or in this case, Nordicist gaze, uh, is something more than passive because you have these uh, these Scandinavians themselves are asking the same questions as the Germans, and and this is a way um, uh, that they are not necessarily pushing back exactly, but that they are engaged in the same project and are not passive actors. Um, uh, and so I thought this was uh, an effective way to bridge what you're working on with uh, more explicitly post-colonialist scholarship um, uh, and, and, and joining that, that current of, of, of uh, German historiography. Um, but I became curious about what the products of their own scholarship was and, 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 and whether there are any products as far as their conscious engage, you know, how did they consciously engage with the Germans kind of trying to analyze them? Uh, where did that, you know, what conclusions did they draw from that? Um, okay. Now I have two, two further questions for you, uh, Lawrence. First of all, um, I became curious about what the content of the Germans fascination was with the North. Um, you know, I, certainly it's easy to think about Wagner. It's, it's certainly think, easy to think about uh, uh, kind of Germanic Nordic mythology. Um, but what else was there? And, and, and what other kind of conclusions did these Germans draw about their own uh, ostensible connections to, uh, to the North? Um, and secondly, you mentioned that, you know, this is in part a quest to find, uh, as you said, on, uh, you know, a, a identity, a heritage unadulterated by classical uh, or, or Christian influences. And that, of course, made me wonder what the role of Jewish influences was and, and whether in, in, the, uh, in your investigations, your, your agents um, also point uh, essentially to anti-Semitic tendencies. Um, uh, did they, did they in, the, in, their, in their own investigations into Nordicism, find ways of kind of excising Jewish influence or, or perhaps where they found it where they did not expect it and that caused for them unanticipated dilemmas of, of defining categories and so forth. So those are, those are my uh, questions for you, Lawrence. And um, now, Sarah, um, the, the thing that really, uh, first of all, st stuck out to me about your paper um, was, I think, how it highlights the, um, you know, you, 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 you have uh, von Siebold, you have Belz, and their anthropological, you know, their, their naturalism here um, in an earlier century uh, as, this, as this heritage, which uh, intellectual heritage, which not only bridges you know, the two papers conveniently, but also I think really helps show how when we get to the 1930s and the 1940s, and uh, suddenly now the, uh, the National Socialist Racial Project is geopolitically broad in alliance, at least theoretically, with the Japanese empire, how it's more than just an ad hoc uh, kind of political ne necessity to, to have to you know, cram the Japanese into this uh, Germanic ger Germanic su supremacist worldview, and and uh, that there is this heritage, intellectual heritage that exists, um, which it ironically then creates problems for the uh, for the Nazi bureaucracy as far as you know where these uh, Japanese really are supposed to fit in the in the racialized Aryan world order. Um, so in that respect, it also helps illuminate the, uh, you know, the the bureaucratic praxis of race um, in this in this in these conditions. Um, uh, but I think the other thing that's really interesting, uh, both in in terms of your paper, but in and of itself, is this myth of the honorary Aryan. And um, until reading this, I hadn't really fully understood just how much much of a myth that was. I mean, I, I guess I had encountered it and thought. Um, that it was uh, indeed a factual category, but apparently not. Um, and yet it had public power, right? There was a rumor about it that um, th that that was transatlantic. That the you know the the, the New York Times is even quoting things to that extent. Um, so the, you know, I think this is really good for showing the the kind of unruly role of public reception of racial theory, even in the context of the national socialist state. Um, and I think. It, maybe you've investigated this, I think it'd be really interesting to know more about why, you know, what's with the longevity of the myth of the, of the honorary Aryan? What, what power does it have for us? What, what, um, you know, 
what usefulness does it have in our own times that allows it to have such a presence on the internet? And I can only imagine what you <laughs> uncovered uh, in, in turning over those rocks on the internet forum. So uh, I, I applaud your bravery there. Um, finally, finally, let me have a couple of questions uh, to, directed at both panel, uh, both papers. Um, I became curious about how your historical figures here, your agents, imagined the uh, kind of competing or external border cases. And what I mean by this is, so we've got Germans thinking about the North, we've got um, Germans and Japanese Germans thinking about these categories. But I became curious, Lawrence, about um, how did your figures, if at all, make reference to um, other nearby or near to German uh, uh, places like the Habsburg monarchy? You know, that you say that the Danube is the Elba and, I'm uh, sorry, the border is the Danube and the Elba. So, you know, how did, did that play a role? Did they think about Austria? Did they think about Poles? How do they think about them, about Russians, about Finns, especially Finns? I'd be curious about sort of where they fit into the northern uh, uh, landscape, as it were. And then, Sarah, um, you mentioned this kind of briefly, but, you know, obviously one of the uh, the, the main condition of the Axis was uh, signing the anti turn Pact. And, and so an, uh, an anti, so it has this ideological as well as racial component. So I be, I'm curious about whether the agents in your case, um, to the extent that they make a reference to the Soviet Union, do they talk about it in racialized terms? Um, I mean, especially your Japanese Germans, do they set themselves apart from, you know, the kind of mongrel, quote unquote, nature of the USSR? Um, and do they try to burnish their anti-communist, anti-leftist, or even kind of class war credentials um, as a part of their uh, you know, attempt to, to make themselves into good national socialists. So um, that was perhaps longer than I had anticipated, but I, I hope there's enough in there for you to think about. Some of it may be useful um, and hopefully enough to get a discussion going. So thank you. So Andrew, do you, do you want us to respond to you or do you want to see, do you want to take questions from the audience or how, how do you want to move forward? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. I kind of got wrapped up there. Um, I don't have any questions yet in the chat, although um, I, I will be collecting them um, as they appear. Uh, so in the interest of kind of maybe keeping things flowing, uh, uh, maybe you should both respond to my commentary, and then we can fold in the uh, the audience's commentary and questions as we go. Well, okay, sure, yeah. Uh, you asked a lot of questions. <laughs> they were very I, good I don't, questions. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I apologize. I don't mean great. for them to necessarily even be answered here. <laughs> no, no, no. I, lo I love it. I, I, I'm actually think like I'm thinking about some of these questions myself, and and the. <sighs> the two that really strike me that you asked are about the mechanics of this exchange, right? A bit between the Nordics and Germanics or Scandinavians and Germans or what, whatever. And then, and then what, what Scandinavians are, are drawing from this. Right. And so I'm, I'm actually thinking about the structure of, of a book, right. That sort of is sort of built around the, these mechanisms. And so I'm sort of right now thinking about categories, right. So I'm thinking about, you know, I talked about August von Schlitzer, the, the, his, the, the quote unquote historian of the 18th century, but I'm thinking of him as an, as an ecumenist, as somebody who is thinking about the way the world is organized. And he, he's not the only one. I mean, there's this whole, this whole group of, of academics in the 18th century who are, you know, who are writing new histories of the world or drawing new maps of the world. And sort of, this is, this is the sort of spatial reorientation that's happening in the context of the enlightenment, in the context of imperialism, et cetera. And so that's one. And, and then also thinking about the, the travelers who go, go to these places, right? Also the, the, what I call the emissaries, people like Ibsen or Strindberg who spend time in Germany, right? Or, or you know, that sort of thing. And then, um, and, then, and then I talked about Mühlenhoff as an academic, as a scholar who is, who is, whose job is to produce knowledge about these places and, and to produce, you know, mainly interpretations. And so, you're, you know, you're seeing a whole variety of different roles that these agents play in this, and they're and they're connecting, and then at times they're not connecting, and that uh, that was part of the argument is that that sometimes when when you have those near misses, that's when 
that's when dialogue gives way to appropriation sometimes, right? So that's a, that's a mechanism I'm, I'm sort of following. And then um, um, I'm, I'm really interested in, <clears throat> and I'm actually teaching a class on, on Scandinavia right now. And the theme of the class is the, is the Nordic ethos, right? The sort of, and and we, we live with this now, right? If you've ever seen a book about uh, the the Scandinavians are the happiest people in the world, and you wonder how how can that possibly be? I just watched a horrible crime drama that was made in Scandinavia, but yet they're very happy. And you know these sort of u- utopian myths. And um, I, I I actually think it's in some ways that that Norwegians and Danes and Swedes invest in this ide- ideal, right? I mean, uh, you, you, uh, uh, the the Norwegians as as pioneers of peace and international you know, understanding. I think they're, that, they're, that that represents an investment or, um, or they even market it. You know, I think that's, we could talk about Ikea as, a, as, as self-branding, right? I mean, the selling Scandinavia on, on the world market, right? I mean, so I, I think that that's, that's one part of it. In the specific dialogue with Germans, I think there's an interesting mix of mutual fascination and deep concern and alarm. And, and especially Danes are trying to manage that feeling about we know we think that we share things in common we can learn from each other but at the same time we'd be grateful if you would stay on your side of the river right <laughs> so that's uh that's you know and then you asked a really interesting question about jewish influence and uh you don't you don't see a lot of of that discussion right that's absent but but what's interesting is you know, you think about the literature on on sort of ethnic fundamentalism and the more positive sort of quote unquote positive aspects of, of German race theory about sort of um, promoting the and this this gets into the sort of how how the Volksgemeinschaft is built in the in the 30s, right? This idea that you belong and and you're part of us and these kinds of elements help reinforce that sort of fundamentalist assumption. That's what that's what I would say about that. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Um, Sarah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm glad you picked up on this idea of continuity because really, really, where I started with this project was um, invariably whenever you teach uh, the Second World War, the first question students always ask is why were Germany and Japan allies? Because on on a very practical level, that just simply makes no sense. Um, you have two states that are both defining themselves in very sort of ugly racialist terms, and yet they they end up together. Um, and so it's it's like the worst marriage of convenience ever. Um, and and one of and one of my sort of central uh, claims in this in this project I'm currently trying to uh, wrap up is that there is this longer history, and that the the alliance when it does. Um, formalize in in the end of the 1930s is not something that emerges out of pure sort of cynical strategic necessity, but actually there's a longer prehistory there um, going back to the 19th century and going back to these sort of deeper, this deeper history of engagement between Germany and Japan. And to your point about why this, uh, why this myth of the honorary Aryan persists and why it is still so salient, I think the, the simplest answer at least in my understanding, is simply because um, there is so much, um, there there are so many questions about this alliance and there haven't been, there hasn't really been a lot of good research to explain the actual mechanics of this, of this uh, alliance. And in the absence of a better answer, in the absence of um, a more uh, concrete explanation, myths and rumors abound. And so this is, this is exact, I see it as sort of a mirror to what was happening in the 30s where people have these certain assumptions, but in the absence of any real concrete policy or any real um, statement clarifying the position, people sort of make their own best guesstimates about what's going on. And so in the absence of that, you have these very creative myths and rumors that proliferate both in the 1930s and then again um, in the darker corners of the internet today. Um, and as, and, and, and on your question about whether, whether there are any sort of, um, others or sort of ulterior models that are being, that are being probed here, there is some discussion of the Soviet Union, um, 
although that tends to be more uh, centered in the 1920s, where you have this argument being made, sort of proposing uh, the Soviet Union. Um, there's this longstanding uh, anxiety in, in German cultural nationalism about the myth or the, I'm sorry, about the East, um, which manifests um, in the Villamine period as the yellow peril. Um, and then that uh, in the teens and 20s is sort of recycled into this um, anxiety about the Soviet Union. In the 1930s, in, in, in this era that I was talking about today, the sort of counter example that you see most frequently used, um, especially in thinking about sort of the the uh, the danger of communism is not the Soviet Union, but actually is China, uh, because uh, for much of the early part of the 1930s, uh, the the Weimar Republic is actually in this very uh, firm and very profitable on both sides relationship with Republican China. And so um, you have, on the other hand, the sort of more ideological elements of the Nazi party pushing to sort of move away from China to, to decouple with Republican China and to form an alliance with Japan instead. And so China becomes this sort of image that is used as a counterexample to Japan showing political instability, this sort of fear of um, sort of corrupted um, Eastern uh, spirituality. And so, so China is really the more salient image in the 30s as opposed to the Soviet Union. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I'm still awaiting uh, questions in the chat. So uh, to the members of our audience, um, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly take questions from the, from the panelists. But, yeah, um, but so it, just to, to our audience, please, you can submit either in the chat function or in the, the specialized Q&A function. I will be watching both of those very intently. But uh, Lawrence, you have a question. Yeah, I have a question for Sarah. I thought I thought your paper was was quite excellent, <clears throat> and um, I actually have a big question. And just do with this what you will. Okay, <laughs> I want to know what your investigation into this particular theme tells us about the debate over Nazi Germany as the racial state, right? The the Burley Whipperman, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, debate which has been i mean there's a lot of uh, oh, yeah. a lot of ink spilled about this discussion what what do you think based on what you've seen so my my thing is i i tend to i tend to sort of subscribe to the more sort of recent revisionist take on on the racial state paradigm uh the the roseman um appendix uh edited volume that came out a few years ago beyond the racial state um for me, my my understanding is is that we have to be aware and sensitive to just how messy and um, slippery race actually was as a theoretical con construct, and then also as a policy in, in in Nazi Germany. And so, one of the things that I was I was really interested in again is thinking about theory versus praxis. Uh, that it's very easy to make all these sort of nice racial models for hierarchies, but then how do you actually put that into pra practice? Um, and, and for me, one of my, one of my big sort of um, contributions or I hope interventions into this, into this discussion is that I feel like for much of the conversation on the so-called Nazi racial state that's tended to pivot almost exclusively around this question of German versus Jewish binary. And I'm really excited to see more recent uh, literature and research sort of problematizing that and thinking about um, it not um, as as sort of neatly bounded in in the way that Burley and Whipperman are talking about, but also thinking about how do how do Asians fit into this? How do the peoples of Latin America fit into this? How do Sub-Saharan Africans fit into this? And so I think at that point we can get into I think a more complicated understanding of how race actually functioned um, ideologically and practically in Germany. But but yeah, so like to to your uh to your uh point, I was I was sort of excited to see someone else who is working on Nordicism because one of the other groups that is referenced a lot in uh, the literature I'm working on are the Laplanders. Um as as sort of this supposedly um, pure primitive people. Um, and so I'm wondering how the Laplanders fit into your, your research, if you've seen these, these sort of discussions about them. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, yeah, less, you know, I know less about the, the German at attitudes towards the Laplanders, but I'm interested in the sort of layering of this conversation, right? Because as, as Germans and Scandinavians are talking about these things, of course, the Swedes and the Finns are engaging in these questions as well, right? I mean, the, you know, Carl Linnaeus fam very famously goes to the northern reaches of Sweden and writes this book about the laps and is sort of hel helping sort of, you know, transform the region for the benefit of the Swedish state and the growth of the Swedish economy. And that sort of leads to this confrontation. And so it's interesting to see how that dynamic is happening on top of a dynamic <laughs> with, with this engagement with Germany. And so that's that's where my interest is really is you know Andrew asked about the Finns and I, my first thought was well the you know awareness and and assertion of Finnish national identity comes a little later right so it's a, a little tougher and I think that's true with the Laplanders too I mean that discovery is there and then you know that confrontation becomes more pronounced maybe um well, I mean, certainly around the time that, say, Knut Hamsun is writing at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, right? I mean, so where, where that real engagement is happening. Because, um, you know, it, before that, m so many Finns were speaking, they were, before the Napoleonic Wars, were part of Sweden, where m many were speaking Swedish and, and, you know, sort of sharing cultural affinities. And then it's only under under Russian control that they begin to shift away and and sort of begin to assert themselves more. So that... So, so there's a t there's a time dimension on top of this as well as a geographical, you know, confrontation. So we have a, a pair of questions that have emerged in the chat now, and uh, wouldn't you know it, they also <laughs> touch on each other in a certain way. So let me read them uh, in the order in which I read them, um, and I'll let you uh, to decide how you want to uh, to address them in common. So uh, Joanne Sanchez asks, how do the Italians fit into this? What did the Germans really think of them? That is, did the Germans try to fit them into Aryans? Um, and there was a second question uh, by Mara Hametz. Looking at models of interwar fascism, have any of you engaged with Italian racist ideas? For example, the idea of honorary Italians is something that was in the Italian fascist racial legislation. So I'd be happy to repeat those, uh, but we have two Italy-centered questions here. Sarah, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I can go ahead. Um, so there is, there is this attempt to create a triangulated understanding of the axis. Uh, so there is a lot of investment put into uh, this, this very glossy periodical, um, uh, Berlin, Rome, Tokyo, which is basically an attempt to sort of situate the three axis powers as all in some way complementary or or sharing some some uh, basic goal. My sense is, is that Italy never fits quite as comfortably into this, into the frame of reference in which Japan is talked about. That my, my, my sense is that Nazi Germany always sort of has a fundamentally different relationship to Italy than it does with Japan. And so, um, so the, the relationship with, with Italy at times is quite profitable and quite good. The relationship with Japan is at times quite profitable and quite good, but when when it comes time to sort of synthesize those into some sort of coherent messaging about the axis, um, is when it starts to run into a bit of trouble. And so you'll see, um, especially as the war starts to go badly, uh, the Japanese frequently sort of held up as this is how our allies should behave, or this is this is our this is what our allies uh, should be doing to hold up their their side of the bargain, and so um, there is this sort of implicit judgment being made against the Italians as in some way inadequate or in some way um, failing to live up to this this putative uh, sort of cultural model of what the Axis was supposed to be, and I think that goes back to sort of again this this longer deeper history of, of uh, German ambivalence about the Mediterranean and German ambivalence about mm -hmm. romantic cultures, going back to the sort of anti-Catholicism of the, of the 19th century and the, and the sort of, the, the ambivalence about the sort of classical heritage is in some way um, rivaling and not necessarily complementary to the sort of Germanic idea that the Nazis are trying to play off. And so, 
it is it is there but i think i think it never quite resolves itself um as as neatly as as does the german japanese relationship and as as far as as far as the sort of italian fascist um uh question is concerned my understanding is is that the sort of honorary italian was sort of intended or was sort of framed in a in a um principally sort of colonial or imperial way which i think certainly makes sense in the context of italian imperialism but then uh, again it, it sort of raises some some tension when you look at germany and japan together because you're dealing with a a non-colonial and non-imperial relationship rather one that's sort of fueled by mutual uh, or mutual uh, interest as opposed to um, for more informal uh, power dynamics. Thank you. Um, uh, Lawrence, did you have any, any Italian uh, insights? <laughs> Do I have any Italian insights? Questions I don't often, don't often get. <laughs> well, this is your chance. To <laughs> I think, I think Sarah, Sarah is totally right. I, I would emphasize the ambivalence. I, I think first of all, that the Italian, the relationship with Italy is never going to be as complicated as it's going to be with Japan um, because, and, and because the, the racial theorists that she was talking about had already thought about this, right? They had already uh, reached what we might loosely call some sort of consensus about some, some of these hierarchies. And so this was less, less complicated, but it, but that it sort of does touch on the, on the divide between the, the sort of racial empirical side that I was talking about in the more more spiritual or what we might talk about in the classical Mediterranean since the aesthetic lineage, you know, it's a much deeper history, much deeper German fascination with the region. And that's that's all complicated. And it's made, made no simpler by the fact that the Italian fascists tried to um, identify themselves with that classical heritage as well. And so, yeah, I, I um that that's that, that certainly changes the I guess the uh, frame of a comparison in that sense. Yeah, perhaps also I, I'm just thinking about uh, potential conflicts over uh, uh, Trentino, right? I mean, you've got border border territories of the incorporated Austria with mm -hmm. the Italian state that also have a um, recent recent frictive past. Um, now there are a couple of uh, follow up uh, comments here in the Q and A and in the chat. So. Uh, Mora uh, um, observes that, uh, incidentally, I am headed to Finland on Saturday for a conference next week on ethnic minorities and anti-fascism. So there's a lot of interest in these issues at the moment. Um, she uh, uh, then went on to comment, uh, uh, in, uh, kind of in response, I think, to uh, your uh, commentary, Sarah, that honorary Italian, quote, not of Italian race, is actually a special status granted by Mussolini. Um, and then she uh, uh, clarified that should be, quote, of the Italian race or, quote, not of the Jewish race is a special status. And then in the chat, uh, Stephen Stilwell uh, uh, commented that there is a tie in with an earlier session uh, where there was a discussion of the difference based on race between the responses to German gas attacks of Algerian and Canadian soldiers. So I, I personally did not attend. So um, uh, to, to my regret, I think. Uh, uh, that would have been a, a nice connection, but I, that's, that's what we're updated on the chat there. So thank you to uh, both of the uh, question askers. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I, just to, just to sort of jump in here real quick. Um, I appreciate those, those comments um, about Italy. And I would, I would just sort of add um that I think one of the things that makes the German-Japanese relationship more complicated and simultaneously also simpler is distance. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that's being talked about and dis and debated in Germany about the Japanese. Certainly, there are Japanese interlocutors, but the distances involved make it a lot more difficult for the Japanese to push back quite as forcefully as 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 the Italians certainly were able to. Um, so just, just as an example to this, I mentioned this briefly in my paper. Um, there, is this, there is this particular fixation in a Nazi racial theory around the Ainu, this indigenous people in Hokkaido and the Sakhalins. And, and uh, certain Nazi theorists, including uh, Johann von Leer, sort of pick up on the Ainu as proof that there was this remnant of 
Aryan or Caucasian uh, racial group in northern Japan, and they sort of used the Ainu as proof that there that there was this there there was this Aryan heritage in in Japan. But of course, from the Japanese perspective, they're simply horrified at this because they perceive the Ainu as this uncivilized, barbaric indigenous people and they were at the same time putting in the process of putting them on reservations and civilizing them in a way very similar to the North American um, uh, Indians. And so I think I think one of the big differences there as well is that uh, the Nazis have a slightly freer reign when it comes to the Japanese in terms of letting their fantasies and letting their imaginations run away with them and thinking about what what is the sort of proper function for the Japanese within Nazi racial ideology? Yeah, I actually think that's a that's a question you might you might get, Sarah. You know, as you continue this work, is the the degree to which the domestic cases that you cite, what's the the mixed race or or you know Japanese who are or Japanese descent who are writing about their honorary Aryan status or their place within the the, the Volksgemeinschaft or whatever, the, the extent to which that forces, is that enough to force a confrontation within, with it for German policymakers when they, when they can otherwise kind of not address this because of the, by virtue of distance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one thing, the one thing I would say is that, um, is that because a lot of these individuals simply because of the different historical relationship between Germany and Japan, whereas in other sort of more colonial contexts, mixed race individuals tend to come or tend to be sort of exist on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder um, because, because of the sort of complexity of, of racial policy. Um, this, this woman that I started with, uh, Hannah Hatzfeld Aoki, um, she's a member of the Silesian uh, aristocracy on her German side mm. and her and her uh, father her Japanese father was the ambassador to the US and so these people is a very small minority but very often they are in um, positions mm. of extreme mm. privilege mm. Um, so they're a lot more visible than they would be normally mm. Mm -hmm. given their numbers um, well I've got two minutes, which is a very awkward amount of time for any future questions, uh, but I don't want to foreclose that possibility. Um, but I don't see any further ones. So so I suppose it's as good a time as any to thank both of our panelists, Lawrence and Sarah, um, for, I think, a really, yeah, really productive free song here. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I wasn't really... I wasn't part of the panel planning process, so I, I don't know kind of whether that was uh, intentional, but it certainly um, worked out. And um, I, uh, I, I, I thank you both for, for having me on as a, as a commentator here. I um, um, look forward to seeing the products of, of both of these uh, uh, areas of research, which um, uh, seem to be really promising. And especially, you know, we'll see maybe in a few years uh, whether or not um, how the, how they uh, kind of keep keep intersecting or not intersecting uh, based on where things go. Um, but thank you both and uh, thank you to all attendees here for um, giving us a listen and for your comments. Uh, so um, yeah. have a have a good conference. Yeah. Well and, and and thank you to Andrew for moderating. Well mm -hmm. Sure, it was fun. I'm, I'm glad I was able to do it. Thank yeah. you. I, I I wish, of course, that, that in in a, in a sort of parallel universe, that uh, I could look forward to uh, all the wonders of, of urban life in uh, in in beautiful New Orleans. But that'll have to wait for some other occasion. Well, you've discovered the European section, so now you know sky's the That's limit right. now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, that is very nice. Yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, it's a kind of Ozark panel inadvertently, but it is nice. It is nice to to feel um, a certain kind of regional. Uh, I don't know, regional networking here that I was not personally aware of before. So this has been a great opportunity to to, to tap into that. So 1955, yeah. Well, I mean, it shows my ignorance is really what it comes down to <laughs> more than anything else. But I'm glad to be I'm glad to be enlightened, at least uh, to approach that uh, a little bit further. So, all right, all right, 4 p.m. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks to the thank audience. Thank you. I appreciate you. Take care.